The next talk is by Morteza Salimogenta. Is that how you pronounce it? Thanks for <laughs> telling me. <laughs> I tried. Uh, they'll tell us about data compression and submodule optimization of feature engineering. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks to organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I'm going to talk about multiple works uh, in our team. Uh, I'm part of the algorithms and optimization team in Google Research. Uh, we have a strong presence in New York, Zurich, and I'm based in Cambridge right across the street here. So if there are local people who want to talk about these problems later on after the workshop, I would be more than happy to do that. Um, and also join work with some of the interns we had from Yale and Georgia Tech. Okay. So um, I'm not going to get into the technical details of these problems. Uh, I hope that I can get you interested in some of these problems and show you why you should work on these problems. Um, um, so, and we will see how much time uh, we have. Um, uh, if, if there is not enough time, I'll uh, skip the last part. But I'm going to talk about vocabulary compression as a problem, feature cross search in machine learning tasks, um, tensor decomposition, and at the end, I'll talk about the classic problem of streaming submodular maximization and some techniques around that. Um, good. So let's just start with the definition of submodular functions because this is going to arise in many of these subproblems. You have a ground set W, and oh. Usually the clicker doesn't work apparently. Okay, so you have a ground set W. Uh, you have a valuation function F that maps every subset of this ground set, some non-negative uh, number. And hopefully you want to maximize it. In some applications, you want to minimize it. Uh, I guess the up uh, has worked on that problem a lot. Um, and um, what is this submodularity? Uh, it, it's based on this marginal value definition that if you have an element E in your ground set, if you add it to a subset X, you get this uh, notation F E of X, which is the marginal value, the extra value that you get by adding E to X. Okay, and submodularity is basically, if you consider two sets X and X union Y, if one of them is a superset of the other one, the marginal value of E to X is bigger than the marginal value of E to the bigger set. So as you grow the set, the marginal value decays. That happens in some applications. It doesn't happen in other applications. But it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's an interesting notation, notion, and uh, it, uh, we have, I have seen it in, in uh, different problems. So, OK. Now, what is the problem that people usually think about? What one, one of the main problems that people think about is this cardinality constraint version of it, that you want to maximize this uh, function given a cardinality constraint k. So you want to select at most k items, and you, you want to maximize the value of your function. Okay? Let's keep that in mind, and then let's jump to some of the examples, uh, like a toy example is coverage type problems. You want to cover these points, these 12 points, let's say, as much as you can. And every element in your ground set is technically a subset of these points. So if, you, if K is two, if you want to pick two subsets and cover as many points as possible, the optimal solution is 11. You pick the bottom set and the green one on top. OK? Uh, but it has applications in um, influence maximization, also in the theory community data summarization, uh, exemplar-based clustering, some other applications, okay? And the best you can get is one minus one over E approximation that's around 63% with greedy algorithm and that's optimal, okay? That's the end of this submodular maximization definition. Let's jump to the first uh, problem, vocabulary compression, okay? What is that? So in some machine learning tasks, uh, in almost every machine learning task, you're dealing with features. Some of these features have categorical values, meaning it can take a value out of n possible values. It's a discrete feature, okay? 
And typically, the way uh, people denote these categorical features is with one hot embeddings. So you have, if you have n values, and if you want to really stick to all the n values you have, you come up with an n-dimensional vector. You just put zero everywhere, one, one in the index that uh, denotes the value. And then you use these vectors in downstream machine learning tasks and uh, neural network uh, linear uh, layers, okay? If you think about it, if, you're, if, you, if you are thinking about a string uh, feature, for example, a text feature, even the simplest one, which is like one token features that you could have billions of va values for that. And if you cross them, it exponentially grows. So we're talking about huge vocabulary sizes here, okay? So how can we uh, simplify that? Well, we can compress the vocabulary. We can say that, okay, so in this case, the feature is the country. It's, it's a small feature. There are only hundreds of possible values here, but just for the sake of the example. Uh, you can think about merging multiple values into one new compressed value, okay? And the goal of uh, the, problem, the algorithm that I'm gonna talk about is uh, basically preserve as much as information you can to predict the label, okay? So you have some label, you wanna maximize the mutual information between the feature and the label, okay? Okay, so, so you have, the first column is the original feature. The second column is the compressed feature. Let's say you wanna predict the, the, their favorite fruit or something like that. Typically we care about um, at click probability, for example, that's the next step. So you wanna compute this mapping of original feature value X to F of X, the compressed value, and you wanna reduce the size and you want to maximize the mutual information between f of x, the compressed feature, and the uh, uh, label C, okay? In the paper I'm going to talk about, they work on the binary labels, okay? So it just takes two values, and it's actually, uh, you cannot generalize it to uh, multiple values, and that's an important open question you can think about, okay? So you have binary features, um, advertising is a good example of that. Um, and apparently they can use, you can use submodular maximization to get a one minus one over the approximation there. Okay, how this is the cute reduction, okay? So there is a lemma in the literature that if you look at the values, each of the values and compute that probability that the feature takes that value given that the label is zero and order all the feature values based on that quantity, the only thing you need to do is to find the partitioning of this. So the compressed features are basically consecutive subsequences of this given sequence, okay? That reduces the solution space Usually, it's still exponential, but um, it simplifies it a lot. Now, what's the submodularity? There's a lot of notation here, but basically, in the top row, you're separating four values from four values by adding a partition S there in the middle. Whereas, if it's more speci specified, you're separating three values from two values. Okay? And you can prove that in the top case, you gain more value. You're, you're, you're doing a bigger separation. You're cutting more edges, let's say, okay? And that's, that's basically the proof, uh, like you need to prove it, but that's the idea, that you prove that it's submodular, okay? I'm gonna give, so this is just a quick summary of another work. Uh, why am I bringing it here? Because I don't want you to get the impression that everything in this domain is submodular. It's, it definitely is not, uh, yes. You're saying the bigger sets have more. I guess I didn't get the example yeah, here. Yes. You're saying bigger sets have more contribution. So, yeah. So, it's basically the way how they formalize it. The way you should think about it. So, if you think about each subset that you're separating and compute the value of that and sum them up, you have a 
similar to welfare maximization objective. That's not how they do it. You should look at these partitions, S1, S2, and so on, as the set that you're selecting. So what you're selecting oh, is these pivot, or these pivots, and that's how. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thank you for the question. Good. Okay, so as just this one another example of non-submodular functions here, if you, for example, want to select a bunch of categorical features, just to train a linear classifier on it, that's a very simple thing to do. It's, uh, there is no linearity when they're just setting the threshold for every possible value. To maximize some learning objective, let's say AUC, which is some function of true positive rate and false positive rates in this case. You get a function, you, and now you want, you want to, out of, let's say, 1,000 features, you want to select 10 of them and as, as your feature cross and maximize your AUC. That becomes a very hard problem to approximate. Okay? If you assume the naive base assumption, that becomes submodular and you can get uh, constant approximations, okay? So now that we're here, since we're jumping to other topics, I wanna mention the open questions around here. So in the previous problem, the result was just for binary features, okay? And it was just for one feature. Um, but that's not how uh, like learning tasks work. There are multiple features, they're not necessarily binary and so on. So think about these works as just starting points that there are interesting algorithmic problems you can think about. For this one, there are many assumptions here. Naive base definitely doesn't work in many settings. Uh, feature cross, you, we are working with feature crosses, but it's not just one feature cross, there are multiple of them. They have to be mixed and so on. So it could get really complicated. Let's jump to tensor decomposition. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, you might ask, why am I talking about this stuff in sublinear algorithms workshop? I think about compression as the sublinearity here. So I'm, I'm not preserving the, because all of these tasks are like pre-processing for further algorithmic emission tasks. So if you're reducing the input size, you're actually solving it in a sublinear way, in one way, okay? Uh, okay, tensor decomposition. This is the one hot embedding that I talked about, okay? So you have a categorical feature, it takes N values. You represent it uh, based on the value, you represent it with one of the N n-dimensional vectors on the left, but typically you learn a dense d-dimensional, a smaller d-dimensional vector for each of these values in your machine learning model, and then use it later on, okay? Now, it, and so first of all, the n, n itself could be large, but I'm gonna show you an example of feature process that how, how it's done and why it increases the number of embedding values that, uh, that we have to deal with. So, so each of the embedding variables on the right side, the D by N uh, values, those are important things that we have to learn. And I'm hoping that with tensor decomposition, you can reduce the, uh, that number, okay? So this is a typical structure of a deep and cross network. The paper appeared a few years ago and it's used in practice. You can look it up uh, in archive or look at the TensorFlow uh, website, okay? So at the bottom, you feed in the categorical feature, but it's, it's been crossed at every level. So you have multiple levels. In each level, you take the value, the vector from the previous layer and the original input and you cross them together. And this is the cross operation is basically Hadamard operator. But the point is that you don't, you don't need to uh, co compile all the math here. The point is that for every value of the feature, you're crossing it with, the, with another value of the feature. So you're, that's why you're actually out of a thousand possible values, you get a million, a billion and so on. So it grows exponentially. And for each of these, you need to learn a coefficient. So th those coefficients are, uh, the variables that you need to learn. So in this uh, operation, the gray circles are the ones that you need to learn, the rest are the input or computed from the, okay? Good, 
Okay, how can you do that with tensor decomposition? Well, if you believe that, if, especially if you're crossing two different features, if you believe that there is some correlation, that there is some structure happening in both of them, or within the feature itself, there is some structure that you, you want to classify them or partition them or something, you may believe that there is a core value in this, in this whole feature. Meaning on the left side, you have all the embedding values. Let's say you're dealing with 1 billion values. So there are three accesses, each of them, let's say a thousand. But actually maybe, maybe you can reduce it to the core tensor, the red one on the right, which is 10 by 10 by 10. And you just need interfaces to map each axis from a dimension of 10 to a thousand. Okay? And on the right hand side, you have much fewer uh, variables to learn, embedding coefficients to learn. Okay? That's why like talker decomposition or any other algorithm that you can do a, this tensor decomposition efficiently might be useful. And these are the things that um, are, are used in practice or at least tried in practice if you can do it efficiently, okay? Why is it useful? If, so one might ask that, okay, you need the embedding coefficients from the beginning, the, le the left side to be able to factorize it on the right, okay? That's a fair point. You can, first of all, start from the beginning with the structure on the right, just learn those. But even if you want the embedding coefficients on the left, uh, it basically means that you have to train the model once, but it's a huge model, but you don't need to do it dynamically every day. Also, it makes a big difference in serving time. So if you're dealing with a billion variables and you need that for serving time versus just those, let's say 10 million, two orders of magnitude lower, um, you, you get a big gain in serving time. So that basically, if you can factorize it, you need less memory to remember the model. Any questions? Okay. You, if you also have questions about the vocabulary comparison, I'm happy to answer that. But we can also get back to it at the end of the talk. Okay, I guess I have a couple of minutes to get to the stuff that you are typically more interested in. So the streaming problem of submodular, uh, it's, uh, so the offline version is one minus one over the approximation. The, uh, the streaming is, uh, is one half uh, competitive. There is a one half competitive algorithm for it and it's tight, okay? What I'm gonna talk about today is a very simple trick to reduce the memory complexity to almost optimal, okay? Yep. Yeah. So the question is, can you define the streaming version of this problem? Okay. Uh, is the offline version clear? Uh, okay, streaming is the next slide. It's basically you, you have a stream of elements. Each of them are coming one by one. You have to decide that whenever the element comes, you have to decide whether you want to keep it or discard it. And your memory is, let's say, the total number of elements you keep. Okay, so the algorithm is very simple. Uh, the one half C with streaming algorithm, it's, it's been there a couple of years now. You start with an empty set, okay? Your stream comes at uh, uh, iteration I, you have to decide whether you wanna keep EI or not. And the selection criteria is very simple. You just look at the marginal value of this new element to your set S. If it's above some threshold tau, you keep it, otherwise you delete it. Also, if you run out of uh, capacity, if you have selected K items so far, you stop. You don't need to keep um, add any other more items, okay? Good. It's... Apparently, if you set the threshold right, you get the one half approximation. If you set the threshold to the optimum value divided by 2K, that's by the way, half of the average contribution of optimum items in the optimum solution you get one half approximation. And the proof is not too complicated. You either select K items, in which case K times opt over 2K is one half of opt. Or if you don't select uh, K items, 
it, you can show that what you're missing from optimum is not more than k times tau. And that's also f of the word, okay? Okay, this, uh, okay, but the question is how can you guess this tau? We don't know opt. We don't know the optimum solution, that's why we don't know its value, okay? So we guess, we, we, we have logarithmic number of guesses for, the, for this threshold tau, log k is enough, you can show that. And this leads to k log k, uh, number of items that you need to keep. Okay. Yeah. So that's the that's part of the algorithm where it comes to its one line. Like here you have many solutions and you will decide it. Sorry, yeah. So so this algorithm is not online in the sense that you 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 can't pick you you will decide at the end what's the solution, right? Like um, you keep in memory different solutions and at the end you output the best essentially. Um, at every moment, if you output the so you have uh, if you output the best solution. That is a one half approximation. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you can't build the solution on, online. Like you decide to assign, like you need to have these parallel guesses. You need to have the parallel guesses. But at every time, I guess you can just set the best of them as like one to your output solution. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is. Okay. So how can we get rid of this extra logarithmic factor? Okay, that's the question. And this trick is very simple. You don't need to actually do anything. The algorithm itself is order k, we just didn't know. This is how we can prove it. There is a lower bound parameter you can define LB to be the maximum value of all these solutions that you have kept so far. That's a valid lower bound on optimum because all of them are valid solutions, okay? How can we use this lower bound? We can, first of all, filter out very small values of tau. We also can bound the size of selected sets. How? Well, if, if a tau is less than LB over 2K, you don't really need to keep it because you, you're aiming for F of opt over 2K and LB is a lower one, okay? That's good. The other thing is that size of S tau and S tau is the solution associated with uh, threshold tau cannot be more than this lower bound divided by tau. Yeah, and that's by definition of a lower bound because look, the lower bound is maximum of F of all of F values and f of s tau is at least tau times its cardinality because for every item you added to s tau, you got tau. Okay, so if you look at this sum, it becomes a geometrically decreasing sum. The first term is order k, that's why the whole sum is order k. Okay, so that's close to optimal memory complexity or exactly the optimum mem memory complexity if you don't care about the constants and epsilon terms. Good. I'm gonna conclude with some of the future directions. I guess I talked about some of them uh, without uh, saying again. For vocabulary compression, the non-binary labels, I think it's uh, very interesting to look at. For feature cross search, I think the most important thing is the first step is to get rid of the naive base uh, assumption. Tensor decomposition, that's really uh, not my area of expertise. I just hope that I showed you that, that that's an interesting problem to look at. Um, for streaming, for this streaming monotons of modular maximization, um, I think these, these dependence on epsilon and constants are really important, at least in practice they're really important, even if you're running experiments for more applied venues, um, they, they really matter. So if you can get rid of the epsilon factors, if you can uh, split it up by another factor of 10, that definitely is helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any questions for Morteza? So for the submodular maximization, you get order K and do you have like one over epsilon cube dependence or something? Is it like polynomial first or logarithmic on epsilon? 
Okay. The dependence on epsilon, is it like one over epsilon or log one over yeah. epsilon? It is, it is definitely polynomial because the thresholds that you need to look at, uh, it starts from, let's say, an upper bound of delta, which is the maximum singleton value or something like that. But the decrease cannot be more than one plus epsilon because you need to really get that threshold tau accurately. You cannot miss it by factor of two or something. And if you are reducing that threshold tau by one plus epsilon, you need one over epsilon of those to get even a constant deduction. So the dependence is definitely at least one over epsilon. Um, in terms of memory complexity, I think you get the same thing too. I mean, it's, it takes one over epsilon steps to get from tau to tau over two, let's say, or tau max to tau max over two, and that's all of them could have order k. So it, the memory complexity is at least k over epsilon. I don't remember exactly whether it, we needed another one over epsilon factor or not. I don't think so. I think it's just k over epsilon, but um, it's not clear whether you actually need it. So is it possible there is an algorithm? I guess the memory of exactly k is not possible, probably similar to what Vincent is saying. It's not an online algorithm. But is it possible to get k plus a small of k, for instance, memory for constant epsilon? No, I think even O of k, actual O of k without dependence on epsilon is very interesting. So let's solve that problem first. No, but I'm saying for constant epsilon. Let's say I want five oh, for approximation. Can I do k plus a small of k now? For oh, like you want 10 just approximation. constant approximation? Yes. It's a very good question. I have to think about it. We can talk about right, that. Thanks. But it's also more of a theoretical question. I would say that <laughs> because uh, it's a constant approximation and in practice, we, even the one minus one over E is not necessarily satisfying enough because in experiments, many times we see at least 90% uh, accuracy. So when you, yeah, so when you run this algorithm, do you get really two approximation in practice or no? You usually get better. I mean, sometimes you cannot prove it, but sometimes you can actually prove that it's at least 90%. And maybe the five approximation also Maybe, but then you're right. Okay, I, you're not going in the right direction. You're erasing the whole idea of proving constant approximations. Um, so, uh, in terms of the open questions, if we replace the um, binary labels with some continuous zero to one labels, um, and replace the information, the mutual information objective with some nice enough continuous cost function. It seems like the main sorting idea that you can simplify to just uh, sort the domain left to right and then find the breaking points kind of should still apply. So do you think uh, there's hope for uh, generalizing the ideas in that direction? As far as I remember, they, the, that lemma really needs this bi binariness of the label. And if you think about the way they, they, they're defining it, I think they're defining it based on the probability that the feature gets a particular value given that the label is zero. And you could think that it's probably, uh, that's why it relies on the binary list, that if you replace that, that given that label is one, should the same lemma should hold, it should be symmetric in general because you are you're predicting a binary variable and a negative of that is the same task. So um, that's, that's why even if you have three values, I suspect that it doesn't work. There should be some symmetry here for the values of the label. And that's why they need binary values. I, I think that's the case. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think that helps. But I'm not completely sure yet. Um, I have a question about the, the way that you define an approximate version of this problem. So we want to find the set of size k that achieve like some constant factor times f of optimal. Um, For the submodular problem. Yes. So what if, if I say I want to pick a set that doesn't have a um, k member, but some, I don't know, one plus epsilon times k member, but it achieves the optimal of the k sets. 
like the approximation is on, is on the uh, size of the set rather than the yeah. value. Yeah. So the yeah the question is basically about the biker criteria setting that you can expand the set and so on. So for the offline setting, I can tell you that that. For the offline setting, that this problem is very well studied. This is, I think, around the result of Feige et al. in the 90s, I think, and probably some follow-up works. And you exactly know how, so if you increase k to k times one plus epsilon or 2k or whatever, how much you can get. The, the hardness result, I think, exactly match what the greedy algorithm gets. I don't think there is any gap there. And if you increase it by one plus epsilon, uh, you definitely cannot gain more than a one plus epsilon factor. I think it's the exponential is basically instead of one minus one over E, you get one minus one over E to the power of one plus epsilon probably. I, I think that's the case. Um, so it buys you an epsilon fraction and that's it. So you cannot relax the setting the threshold problem much more. Um, for the tensor decomposition results, I think you mentioned Tucker decomposition. What kind of decompositions do you run into in your applications or which will be useful for you? So the, the problem is that many of, I, as, if I understand correctly, this, this is the area that my colleague Matthew Farbach and others are really working a lot on. If I understand correctly, the algorithms that are out there are not that scalable and like the, the running times are not that good. So either we get inspired by them, try to get the ideas and implement them in a more scalable manner or we have to design it ourselves. So we don't have like a candidate algorithm as of now. And it's a very new problem. We are like working with the data and seeing what kind of things might work, but it's a very promising direction. It seems that because ML efficiency in general is becoming more and more important. Like in the past 10 years, if you look at the ML models, they have grown exponentially. Now the question is that, do we really want to throw that much capacity at them? So then that's, that's why you need a trade-off between um, the computation power and uh, quality of solution. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I guess if there are no further questions, I can thank Morteza again.